Let's begin this morning by just establishing a bit of context to where we are in the flow of the book of Genesis. Jacob, our man Jacob, his life is a total disaster. Like he has made an epic mess of everything. His life is in turmoil. As he returns to the promised land, Laban, all of those things are behind him, but his pressing concern is this volatility over the coming showdown with his twin brother Esau, which was toxic, this relationship. Last Jacob had seen Esau, he had swindled his father out of the birthright, and as a result, Esau was determined to kill his brother. Jacob had to flee. It's been 20 years. For all Jacob knows, Esau is still determined to take his life. Now, the night before this unavoidable encounter, Esau and Jacob are going to come head to head. There's no doubt, all things considered, Jacob's afraid. In spite of his best laid plans, there's no question his future at this point in his life is uncertain. He doesn't know what tomorrow will bring. Jacob finds himself all alone. He's at the point of emptiness. Jacob is out of options, out of schemes, out of plans. In a sense, Jacob has pushed all of his chips into the pot and he's called. His cards are laid on the table. The percentages no doubt stacked against him. Jacob is at the mercy of the flop. Jacob is at the end of himself. And yet, that just so happens to be exactly the place Jesus wanted him to be. Genesis chapter 32 closes with a true fisticuffs. Jesus comes out of nowhere and wrestles with Jacob. It's an amazing scene. Jesus goes on the attack. Jesus is the aggressor. In a sense, God picks a fight with Jacob. And while Jacob would initially fight back, it would seem at some point During this evening, when Jacob came to the understanding of who it was he was really wrestling with, who the man was, that something changed in his heart. A switch was flipped. There was a moment in time as Jacob is wrestling with Jesus that he goes from wrestling to clinging, from fighting off to grabbing hold. When Jesus commands Jacob, as the sun's beginning to rise, to let go of him, Jacob replies with tears, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob, our boy Jacob, has finally reached the moment when he's recognized that apart from God's grace, he was absolutely nothing. Jacob grabbed hold of Jesus and he wouldn't let go. Jacob has reached the point that he was willing to admit who he was. Jesus asked him, what's your name? Jacob had to to admit that he was insufficient. Jacob had to willingly surrender himself to the influence of divine grace. This This is the statement, unless you bless me, I'm nothing. My life is nothing apart from your blessing. And then what happened? God transformed his life by giving him a new identity. Though in his flesh, Jacob had been known as Jacob, a heel catcher, from that day forward, in God's eyes, he would be known as Israel. It's interesting. But Jacob refused to let go of Jesus. Why? He refused to let go. He grabbed hold until God gave him a blessing. Jacob wanted desired, knew he needed God's blessing in his life more than anything. So what blessing did God in turn give him? The blessing? The blessing I need and you need and we all need is very simple. The blessing God gave Jacob, what he needed more than anything, was a new name, a new identity, a new nature. Understand, friend, The greatest blessing you can or will ever receive from God isn't stuff. It's the fundamental transformation of you. It's what you need more than anything. 
by God's grace demonstrated through Jesus' work on the cross, the amazing reality of the gospel is that you really can be given a new start, a new beginning, a new heart. I don't want to go on a tangent, but you need to know something very simple this morning. And this is going to be a, a tough pill to swallow, but it's a truth. Your fundamental problem You ready? Your fundamental problem, it's very simple. It's you. Your problem is the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. That's your problem. Your core issue really does come down to one fact. Your problem isn't your wife. Your problem isn't your kids or that annoying boss. Your problem isn't that job, society, a lack of an education. Your problem isn't even Donald Trump. Your problem isn't your upbringing. It's not the dysfunctional home life you had. Your problem isn't your parents, their involvement, lack thereof, or the fact that you just weren't loved and appreciated enough as a kid. See the truth is that because none of those things are your problem, changing any of those things never addresses the problem. Your core issue is very simple. You were born broken. You were born into sin. Your problem, and be honest, be honest with me for a minute, your problem is really illustrated by the fact that you are really good at doing the wrong thing And it's so hard to do the right thing, right? I mean, you're really good at sinning, almost like you were born that way. Like it's just what comes naturally. And that's your problem, because it does. You were born broken. And here's the thing. Until you could admit that none of those other things are your issue, but that you're your greatest problem. Until you can admit that, you'll never be open to the solution. Because the solution is God changing you. You see, religion. Religion fails. Because religion gives a person a set of things you can do to change you. And yet, isn't it illogical to think the fundamental problem I have, me, can play any significant role in in the solution? Isn't that illogical or circular? And yet the good news, the gospel of Jesus, is that through the indwelling of God's spirit, it is possible that you can be dealt with, that you can be born again, that you can be given new life. While it's true, that you can't change who you are, you can be changed by your creator. This is what happened in the life of Jacob. Because he was willing to finally admit that he was his problem, God could now transform him. From God's estimation, Jacob would no longer be that old man that man Jacob, from that point forward, he would become Israel. In one moment, via a work only God could perform, Jacob goes from being a hill catcher, a real schemer, to Israel, a man governed by God. Imagine the moment. So Jacob is in Jabbok. He wrestles with Jesus. He has this radical experience. In the process, Jesus strikes his hip. He's got a limp, changes his name. Jesus goes away. Jacob comes across the brook to catch up with his family. He looks disheveled. His hair's out of place, his beard. He's been in a fight all night. He's sweaty, his clothes are torn, and he's limping. And you can imagine as he's walking into the camp, people are looking at him, thinking, what? just happened to you. His wives come up. Jacob, what happened last night? Imagine the moment where he just looks at them. My name ain't Jacob. (laughs) 
I had a fight with God. It lasted all night. My name's Israel from this point forward. It's Israel to you. And he just keeps, like, like this has been a moment that has changed him. He will have this limp forever, a physical reminder of an inside transformation, Jacob. And while all of these things are amazing, what follows that moment demands our careful consideration. As we're going to see in the next few chapters, just because God had given him a new name, the new name Israel, didn't mean Jacob no longer existed. Though positionally, he's Israel. A man governed by God, practically, Israel, still acts a lot like Jacob. It's funny. This is why the next few chapters are important and honestly why Jacob is kind of one of the more relatable, identifiable characters in all of the Bible. This man has experienced an incredible transformation brought on by a supernatural work of God. Jacob has become Israel. And yet this new identity didn't automatically guarantee he'd always act like Israel, a man governed by God. The truth of Jacob's life and the example that his life presents is that while he was Israel in the eyes of God, even after an encounter with Jesus, he still behaves like an idiot, like a moron, like a schemer. He still succumbs to his flesh, that man known as Jacob. Friend, you need to know this morning that while you may have stopped wrestling with Jesus in the big sense. While you may have come to this point where you've accepted his grace and seen a transformation occur in your life as you've been given a new identity, you are now a son and a daughter of the Most High. That's who you are, declared righteous. That doesn't mean, though, that the battle now ceases. As a matter of fact, the truth is a whole new battle now ensues. This new identity that you've been given in Christ through his indwelling spirit, what happens? Yes, you're not wrestling with Jesus. You've surrendered. A new battle starts. This identity you've been given in Christ now begins to wrestle with the person you used to be in your sinful flesh. The Bible describes in the New Testament this fisticuffs, this turmoil, it describes it as the battle between your flesh and God's spirit. The wrestling, it shifts from who you are and the person of Jesus to now who you were and the person God has made you. What was once an external battle now moves inward. Your flesh, this old man, wars with the new man, God's spirit inside of you. Over the next two weeks, we're going to be wrapping up our examination of Jacob, at least as it pertains to him being our, our chief character of emphasis. In chapters 33, 34, and 35, we're going to see Jacob, characterized by his fleshly tendencies, wrestle with Israel, his new identity. And the reality is that throughout these chapters, we will see this man start strong, dealing with Esau, before very quickly falling flat on his face. Sadly, in these chapters, you will see a lot more of Jacob than you do Israel. We'll see him succumb to his flesh and fail to walk consistent with his new identity. And we will see severe consequences manifest in his life as a result. Because of his failure to walk in God's grace, his failure to walk in this new identity, man, he experiences terrible results because he fails to be Israel. Now, as, as our approach is concerned, we're going to start this morning in chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to go as far as we can. And then wherever we stop, we stop. And it's that point that we'll pick up next Sunday and then by the end, we'll hopefully get all the way through chapter 36, which is important because what's great is 33, 34, 35 is Jacob. 36 is a weird chapter. It deals with the genealogy of Esau. We'll get to that. 
And then chapter 37 really marks an interesting transition for us because Jacob will become a secondary character and the whole narrative of Genesis focuses on one man for the remaining 13 chapters, a man by the name of Joseph. So we'll work our way the next two weeks, take a Sunday off for Easter and pick back up with Joseph uh, later in the month. Verse 1, chapter 33, Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, bum, 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 with 400 men. So Jacob divides the children among Leah, Rachel, the two maidservants. He puts the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, Rachel and Joseph last. Now that sounds bad, but Jacob crossed over before them. And he bows himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. What a scene. It's been 20 years since these brothers have last seen each other. And a ton has transpired. Esau's family has grown, his position in the land increased. Despite the difficulties of living in a foreign land, Jacob has done pretty well for himself. He's been blessed in his own right. What is tragic about all of this is that this 20-year separation between brothers had been self-inflicted. Jacob had been wronged in in that he tricked his father for the birthright. Esau, on the other end of the equation, hadn't helped matters as he kind of overreacted, wanting to kill his brother. Both parties had guilt. Sadly, because they failed to resolve the conflict, these brothers, twins, end up missing out on 20 years of each other's lives. Now notice the conditions for reconciliation. First, the scene gives us, it presents for us a very humble and contrite Jacob. We're told, quote, he bowed himself to the ground. Seven times as he's approaching Esau, Jacob, he accepted his role. He owned his part. Though Jacob could have stood there and made the case that the birthright was really his, that Esau had no right, no claim, that Esau, that the whole problem had been Esau, It had been his fault. Jacob doesn't do that, does he? He owns his part, he humbles himself, and he's contrite. And aside from this, Esau also reacts appropriately. We read, he ran to meet Jacob, embraced him, fell on his neck, and kissed him. While Esau could have rightly remained vindictive, while he could have maintained a grudge, feeling as though he had been swindled and robbed by his younger brother, Instead, what does he do? Esau makes a decision to demonstrate love and forgiveness towards Jacob. He doesn't approach with his grievances. He's let them go. We're told as Esau and Jacob embraced, these two men, who are about 100 years old, are weeping. They're weeping. The emotion. Clearly, these two brothers had come to understand that their disagreement had not been worth the time they had lost with one another. Each of them owned their part, let go of their grievances, and they wept as a result. If you've allowed a conflict to drive a wedge between you and a brother or a sister, in a literal sense or in a spiritual sense, please consider this. Is the issue fostering contention really worth the relationship you're going to lose? Is it really worth it? The truth is that like Esau and Jacob, the reason to separate was not worth the brotherhood that was squandered. If this is you, and you're thinking of that person right now, most of the time, Those squabbles are over petty things, trivial things. If we really set what is driving us apart in the greater context of the relationship we're going to lose, we would take a step back and say, no, 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 no. That ain't worth it. 
And if that's the case, may I exhort you to humble yourself. Own your part. You did play a role. Let go of any grievance and forgive and seek reconciliation, seek restoration. Never forget this. Only two things you can take to heaven. The Bible says, store up for yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rust don't corrupt, where a thief can't break in and steal. So what is that treasure in heaven? What can we store up for ourselves in heaven? Two things. Your friends and your memories. Those are the only two things you can take to heaven. And if you have a wedge that's been hammered in tight between you and someone else, a fellow brother or sister in Jesus, let me just ask, there will come a day reconciliation will happen. It would be a lot easier for you to do it now than to do it in heaven when Jesus is like, yo, it's time to get along. You want Jesus moderating? Because you're going to be worshiping arm in arm with that person for eternity. Well, verse 5. Esau lifted his eyes and saw the women and children, Jacob's wives and children. And he said, who are these with you? So Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. You kind of can hear a different tone in his voice, right? Then the maidservants came near, they and their children, and they bowed down to Esau. And Leah came near with her children and bowed down. Afterwards, Joseph and Rachel came near and they bowed down. Then Esau said, what, what did you mean by all this company which I met? Don't forget that, that as you know, Jacob has kept his family at the end, all of his servants, all of his cattle, everything has been going up ahead, passing Esau and his servants, and they've been giving gifts, right? We read about that in a previous chapter. So gifts have been given to Esau. And so he's asking, what, what's the deal with this, Jacob? And Jacob replied, these were to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Now, understand, the purpose in giving these gifts, the, the gifts that Jacob sent ahead to Esau, had more to do with, with making restitution or trying to butter up his brother. In this particular culture, the act of offering a gift with the other party receiving that gift served to formalize a peace accord. Jacob is giving a gift. It's important Esau culturally receive it so everyone knows the hatchet's been buried. Jacob has done his part. Esau's like, I got enough. I don't need it. But we're going to see Jacob's like, no, 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 no. You need to take it so that peace is established. It's formalized. We've buried the hatchet. We've moved on. So he says in verse 10, no, please, if I found favor in your sight, receive my present from my hand inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I have seen the face of God and you were pleased with me. Please take the blessing that is brought to you because God has dwelt graciously with me and because I have enough. So Jacob urged him and Esau took it. That's pretty self-explanatory. A little negotiation. Jacob relents. Okay, I understand the importance. I take it. Now, on the surface, this, inter this interaction, below the surface, we find something that you might not have seen in a cursory reading. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, Esau initially rejects Jacob's offering under what pretense? He says, look at it, quote, I have enough. In the original language, this word enough, it, it means much or abounding in, and we can understand he's referring to his possessions. And yet, in verse 11, when Jacob says to Esau, God has dealt graciously with me, I have enough, we find a completely different word in the Hebrew for enough. Whereas Esau had much, Jacob is literally saying and using this word, I've got everything. I have all things. While Esau, and notice it, while he's evaluating himself in monetary terms, Jacob here acknowledges that since he has the grace of God, he had everything he'd ever need. Esau's like, man, I got enough stuff. 
And Jacob's like, because God has dealt graciously with me. Because I've got God's grace, man, I've got everything. I don't need anything. It's pretty cool. Then Esau said, verse 12, let us take our journey. Let us go. And I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak, the flocks, the herds, which are nursing, are with me. And if men should drive them hard one day, the flock will die. Please let my Lord go ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace, which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. (laughs) Oh, Jacob. This is where things start turning. Esau. He's wanting this reunion party to continue by hosting Jacob and all that he has at his home, which is in an area known as Seir, about 100 miles south of where they're presently located. So this is Esau's intention. Hey, this has been great. I've missed you 20 years. We've got a lot to catch up on. Let's not chill here. Come to my place and let's hang out. Just everybody come. Let's roll. Now, don't forget, Jake, Esau is only traveling with 400 men. Jacob is traveling with everything he owns. And his concern is that because of his quick departure from Haran, like like he goes 300 miles in seven days, like he is moving. Jacob's concern is that if they now try to keep pace with Esau, going down to Esau's home in Seir, that the flocks, the children, everyone's not going to make it. Like they need a little R&R. His crew needs a break. And so what basically Jacob is saying here is he's saying, Esau, bro, the offer's kind. This is great. Uh, The invitation, that's wonderful. We kind of need a break. I can't move at your pace. So you kind of go up ahead and then just give me a little time. I'll eventually catch up with you and Seir. However, that sounds great, but it wasn't Jacob's intention at all. Verse 15, so Jacob said, Now, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But Jacob says, what need is that? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth, built himself a house, made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth, or literally booths. Now, let me explain what's happening. Esau leaves expecting what? He leaves expecting his brother to be following a hundred miles south. Jacob is kind of chilling, waits for Esau to get over the hill. He's like, all right, bro, we're going north. About faces, it goes a mile north, settling in this area known as Succoth, where he builds himself a house and booths for his livestock. Aside from the reality that Jacob totally lies to his brother, he has no intention of ever heading to Seir. Not one aspect of this decision to settle and sucketh was good. Back in Genesis 31, verse 13, when Jacob has this stirring, he has this desire, he's like, we need to leave Haran, I need to get away from Laban. He has a powwow with his wives. And he tells them that the God of Bethel had spoken to him, saying this, this is the command, arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. Then in a prayer recorded in Genesis 32, verse 9, Jacob takes this divine instruction one step further, saying that God had told him to not just return to your country, but to your family. Presumably, speaking of his father Isaac, who's living south in Hebron. So understand, the command that God gives Jacob when he's in Haran with Laban, it's simple and it's twofold, threefold. Leave here, get out of here. Return to the land and return to the house of your father. Go back to Isaac. Now, the reason that this is noteworthy is that by sowing roots in Succoth, Jacob is in direct disobedience to the commands of God. The Jabbok Valley in this town of Succoth were located on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Succoth existed outside of the promised land. He is not returning to the land by settling in this city. So why would Jacob fail to obey God, 
fail to return to the land, fail to return to his father. Now, though we're not specifically told and are only left to assume, I think it's likely Jacob, the same excuse he gives for not following Esau, he gives for settling in Succoth. He's tired. He's tired of moving. He's wore out. I just need a break. After the several hundred mile trek from Haran to Jabbok, Jacob wants to chill out, which explains why he builds himself a house. Jacob's intention in Succoth was not a temporary reprieve. His intention was a permanent stay. Consider that while Abraham and Isaac had settled in various areas for extended periods of time, this is the very first reference we have of any of the patriarchs building a house. Up until now, Abraham, they dwelt in tents, not permanent homes. They were nomads, sojourners, pilgrims passing through. Tragically, Jacob's desire for comfort and the fact he wanted to build a house proved to be nothing more than complacency. He was called to be a pilgrim. And yet, Jacob makes himself a home. And in doing so, what's happening? He is settling for far less than what God had intended to give him. Understand, a person is in no greater spiritual danger than when they believe falsely that they've gone far enough. I hope you know that. I'll repeat it. A person is in no greater spiritual danger than when they believe they've gone far enough. There's no time out in the race. If you're not moving forward, you're not stagnant, you're sliding backwards. It's progression or regression. There's no in between. It's the tendency of our flesh to settle, isn't it? Not the desire of the Spirit. Because it's the desire of the Spirit that is actively always stirring within us a desire to go farther and to go deeper with our relationship with Christ. Yes, Jacob. It's true. you got to give him credit. He had been obedient by leaving Haran, but God had not called him to settle for Succoth. What's interesting is that while Jacob would spend 10 years, 10 years in Succoth, we have zero mention of A, anything happening, or two, zero mention of God ever speaking. Jacob's complacency had yielded spiritual stagnation. Ten years of silence. Understand, these ten years ultimately are never even recognized by God. And in one aspect you see his grace. In Hebrews 11, we read in God's evaluation of Jacob, that like Abraham and Isaac, Jacob too dwelt in tents, having a heart for a city built in heaven. Wait a second, he built a house. Didn't always dwell, in, not according to God. On one aspect, there's grace in the fact that God didn't even recognize it. Why? Because God doesn't see him as Jacob, right? Who does God see him as Israel? And Israel would never do that. That's being disobedient. It's as though God cast his sin as far as the east is to the west. And it's a circle, so you'll never get there. Buries it in the deepest part, wipes it clean, which is the status we have in heaven. That's grace. But here's what's sad. Jacob, through disobedience, lost 10 years. Yes, God's grace is sufficient. But do you want to lose 10 years of what God might be wanting to do in your life because you were complacent? and wanted to be comfortable, and were tired? Well, then Jacob, verse 18, and notice, then Jacob, nothing mentioned. He came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padaharam, or Haran, and he pitched his tent before the city, and he bought the parcel of land where he pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected an altar there and called it El Heloi Israel. Now, the, we have a transitional phrase here. Look at it again. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem. And that indicates 
Something had taken place while Jacob was in Succoth that necessitated he immediately and quickly uproot and move his family. He had to flee to arrive safely. The implication being that Jacob would have never left Succoth. He would have remained there in this place of compromise otherwise. (laughs) How interesting that God allowed some unspecified crisis to move Jacob out of his place of comfort in order to lead him into the land God wanted for him. Friend, I hope you know that God loves you enough to allow things circumstantially to arise to shake you out of your your complacency. Because Jacob would have stayed and sucketh forever, robbing himself of the life God had called him to. What does the Lord do? He allowed something to arise to specifically move him in the direction God had called him. Sadly, though we see Jacob is back into a tent, his decision to settle down in Shechem was still an act of disobedience. Jacob, not Israel, not a man governed by God, still remains this dominant fixture in his life. Yes, Jacob was obedient to leave Haran. Yes, now he's in the land of promise, that's true. But what had God also instructed? It wasn't just to leave Haran, it wasn't just to get to the land, it was to return where? To his father, who is still in the south in Hebron. Pastor Joe Foch, he rightly said to this point, half-hearted obedience is still full rebellion in the eyes of God. Aside from settling in an area with close proximity to Canaanites, specifically settling close to the children of Hamor, Jacob, he erects an altar to the Lord. What makes this act so egregious is that Jacob is building an altar to God in a place God was not asking him to build an altar. Why would Jacob do such a thing? I think it's because he's seeking to do what our flesh tries to do, what we often do, and that is trying to get God to bless our partial obedience. Well, I've done this. Bless me. I've come this far. Isn't that good enough? Oh, how our flesh loves to try to get God to honor and to bless our sin. Instead, Jacob's refusal to obey God is now creating a dynamic where not only is he not going to be blessed, but this and these series of disobediences will create a dynamic that will have far-reaching and tragic consequences for his family. Chapter 31, I mean 34, verse 1. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her, lay with her, and violated her. There's a couple details you need to keep in mind. First, Dinah was the daughter of Leah, an only recorded daughter of Jacob. We were given details of her way back in the genealogy. Secondly, according to the chronology of the last few chapters, it's safe to assume Dinah, by chapter 34, is somewhere between the ages of of 16 and 18 years old. Additionally, this detail that Dinah went out to see the daughters of the land reveals a a few regrettable developments. Not only does it indicate Dinah was restless and impressionable. But it seems that she was willing to conform to the world as opposed to remaining holy and set apart. Tragically, Dinah, she sees the daughters of the land. She goes out, see what's going on. Looks fun. She's partying. And in the process, she catches the attention of a bad hombre. We're told that the son of Hamar, prince of the country, 
a man by the name of Shechem, not only starts crushing on Dinah, but we're told he took her, laid with her, and in the process violates her. This word took, it indicates the sex was not consensual. Dinah was raped. Now though what happened to her is in no way her fault, and and I need to say that, she's completely innocent. She's the victim of of a gross violation. Not to mention, it would be inappropriate to cast blame her direction. So I I hope you understand the heart behind that. But I would still be amiss if I didn't point out that Dinah had placed herself into a dangerous situation the very moment she chose to hang around people who didn't share her same standards. And that needs to be said, you youth sitting in the audience... The Bible says that bad company corrupts good morals. Yes, what happened to her is tragic. She should have never been there. She should have taken a stand. She should have not hung around a bad crew. It's a sad indictment on the American church that I have to say this, that we just that I can't assume you're aware, but I do. Christian You need to know this. The world is not your friend. It's a bummer, I gotta say that. But we've so blended the church and the world that it's we've muddied the line. The world is not your friend. The truth is there is a very real and powerful enemy described in the scriptures as a lion searching for those he may devour on the prowl, looking for you. Satan's intention in your life, his purpose in your life, his plans for you. No. Satan wants to steal from you. He wants to kill you. And he wants to destroy every part of you. He wants to violate you and take away your innocence, and remove your standing. The world is not your friend, and and the danger is real. Now, understand, I'm not an isolationist. And for those of you who know me, you can can understand. I am not one of these people that, that we should fear the world, because greater is he in me than he who's there. And I, it's hard for me to be light if I don't go into the darkness. It's hard for me to be salt if I'm just hanging out with salt. We're just a little over salty at that point. If we're to be flavor, I got to be spread out on a good steak, right? I mean, there is this balance of being in the world, but not of the world. The truth, Dinah had no business where she was. She didn't stumble upon a danger. She walked right into it. And how did it begin? Pay attention to this, especially you youth. It began where? Right here. She saw. It was her eyes. She saw the daughters of the land. And then what happened? What she saw created an image that she began to dwell on. And in the process, a desire within her began to stir She became curious. She dwelt on it. (laughs) What they were doing, it looked so innocent. Hey, it looked fun. Everybody was doing it. Sadly, because Dinah's heart wandered, her feet were very quick to wander. It's been said, your feet will never travel to a destination your heart hasn't already visited. And that's the truth. Guard your eyes. As a child of God, the daughter of Jacob, granddaughter of Isaac, and great-granddaughter of Abraham, Dinah had no business associating with such a crowd. She had been called by God to be separated, to be an example of holier, higher things. Dinah. That's tragic. But you know, beyond all of that, ticks me off about the passage is where in the world was Jacob? 
Not only had that man's failure to obey God placed his family members into a compromised position. As a man, his failure to obey God placed his family right outside the city of Shechem. But beyond that, why was his daughter even allowed to explore her curiosity? As a father, as the spiritual head of his home, Jacob should have taken a stand. He should have said, no, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Honey, my job isn't to be your friend. It's to be your defender. It's to be your protector. I'll stand before God as a result. You can be at mad. You can run back to your room and slam the door and say you hate me. My son gets upset when I lay down the law. And he says, I don't like you. And you know what I say right back? I don't care. (laughs) My job, my God-given responsibility as your dad, son, isn't to be liked. It's It's to be a speed bump. No one likes a speed bump. But it'll slow you down. And it'll keep you out of trouble. And it'll keep you from going in places you shouldn't be. Dads, there'll come a day that you can be your child's friend. But that day is not now. That's not your job. And that's not your role. This daddy failed on the job, allowing his daughter to go someplace that she shouldn't have been. He should have protected her. Why in the world would Jacob allow Dinah to dabble in compromise. I'll tell you why. And please listen to this. It's a whole lot harder for a parent to take a godly stand against compromise when that very parent is living a life of compromise themselves. Why did Jacob fail to say, no, 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 no? Well, hadn't he moved his tent outside the city? He had had 10 years of compromise after compromise after compromise. He failed because he had already failed. Parent, if you walk in the flesh, you will have a hard time representing Jesus to your children. What these children needed is Israel. And instead they got Jacob. And Jacob put his children into a very terrible place. Now, we have to pause here. Dinah, she's been violated. As a matter of fact, she's being held against her will. This is not going to play over very well. Matter of fact, the boys are going to hatch a plot. They're going to enact a little revenge. It'll include a little circumcision. It's quite a story. You can read ahead. We'll get to it next Sunday. But the point, you see in it, Jacob has an encounter with Jesus, changes his life. He's Israel. And he's very quick to go back to whom? To walking in the flesh, to being Jacob. What's amazing is that even in the place of his failure, was God done with him? Was God like, dadgummit? I mean, what more can I do? No. His grace was still sufficient. Jacob needed to reach a point, and he'll reach it soon, where he's like, enough of walking in the flesh. I need to walk in the Spirit. I need to start living in accordance with the identity that I've been given by the Most High. God changes your life. It's easy for us to walk out the door and step right into a puddle, right? We do it. Good thing God's not through with us in that moment. Hey, as a matter of fact, what Jesus did on the cross still remains sufficient. He didn't save you because you're going to be perfect. He saved you because he knew you never could be apart from him. And so, Father, it's with that thought.